Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us today and being willing to, to be our first person. And you have so much to say to us in our short period that we'll, we'll go ahead and get right to it if that's okay with you. Let's begin with you telling us what you can about your family and your own early years before the Anschluss when Hitler annexed Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938. And of course, you were so young that what you know is what you've learned you know, from, from your parents and others. But share what you can about those very early years. Well, all I can say about those early years is that uh, my father tried to get my grandmother, the one where you will see where you saw the uh, Stolperstein, mm -hmm. the stone of memory, and he wanted to get her out of uh, Hamburg, Germany. Uh, and uh, he said, that's the last time I go to Nazi Germany. And uh, that was that. Otherwise, uh, I know we fled Paris a few times after Crystal Nord, and then we came back to Paris, and we fled uh, when Hitler invaded Austria. But those are things that I, I because I read them, I, I was much too young, and I didn't really understand at all what was happening. I, I was just a happy young child, and mm -hmm. playing with my big sister. Mm -hmm. a, a, a couple of questions about that time, though. What were your parents' nationalities? You were living in Paris, but what was their nationalities? Yeah, um, my father was Dutch, and uh, Dutch. for generations and generations, and his, his town called Almelo in Holland has uh, tombstones from uh, past uh, centuries. Uh, he was in training in Hamburg, Germany, and Hamburg is fairly close to uh, Almelo, which is in mm -hmm. Holland. And uh, he met my mother, and they fell in love. They corresponded for um, about four years, I believe, or five, and uh, they got married. And uh, my father was offered a job in Paris uh, in 1926. He was always very proud to show that he was in Paris. And uh, my mother went with him, and she became Dutch by marriage. She became Dutch by marriage. Yes. What, what was your father's occupation? What did he do to earn a living? He, he was a businessman, uh, import, export of um, fancy goods. And uh, I can go ahead and, uh, and tell you what happened when uh, uh, the Nazis, the Germans, were in France, that he lost his job. L later, yeah. when, they, when they came, in right. In 41, not that yeah. late. But even before that, I think you shared with me that he had gone through some hard times financially with the business um, in the 1930s. Well, there was a depression, Dep just like World. in the U.S. Exactly. You know? yeah. uh, and his family in Holland, his brother and the rest of them, was suffering also from uh, uh, that depression. One, one more question before we move on. Did you have a large extended family? We had nobody in France. But, uh, but beyond France, relatives elsewhere. Well, we had our family in Holland. Right. And um, our grandmother in Hamburg, Germany. Right. Right. And uh, they had uh, children that went uh, in 1938 on the kinder transport, and they went to oh. England, the children. I have photos of, of them, a photo okay. that is in the Holocaust Museum, actually. Okay. Yeah. After the Anschluss, which took place in 1938, your parents left Paris with you and your sister Manuela for a short time. Tell us what you can, again, knowing how young you were, tell us what you can about the events that occurred for your family um, before Germany invaded Poland in 1939. You did leave Paris for a period. Tell us what you know about why they moved and what it was like in, those, in that time right before the war began. I really have no recollection, mm -hmm, you know, it's mm -hmm. impossible. I don't know if anybody here remembers a grandmother from when they were three and right, four years right, old. Right. You know. I remember you telling me that you had a, um, um, even though you don't remember much by the time your parents took you to uh, Fontainebleau uh, for a period, um, uh, I guess right after the war began, and you returned, and you said it was, um, you referred to it as um, an appeasement period. What, what did that mean? 
It was right after the war began in, in September 1939. Yes, uh, there was no real war at that time. And um, the French believed that um, nothing was going to happen. And uh, my grandmother actually in Hamburg, Sophie Hess, uh, said, oh, it's just a passage and it, Hitler will uh, go away. Uh, so, but the appeasement is that uh, there was, uh, uh, all the French soldiers were called uh, to arms, and, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was nothing happening. Right, right. Before the war began in September, in March 1939, your parents had you and your sister declared French citizens. How, why was that significant? Well, in France, even though you are born, I was born in Paris, my sister was born right. in Paris, we were not officially declared, and my father, I have papers signed uh, mm -hmm. and saying, declaring us, well, asking permission for us to become French, mm -hmm. and that was quite an event. I have that on the wall in my uh, <laughs> in my hallway, and um, the problem is, or the catastrophe is that uh, uh, with Hitler uh, invading France, mm -hmm. uh, we lost our uh, French citizenship, and we became uh, Dutch again from our parents' side. And uh, so we were Dutch Jews, and foreign Jews were the first ones to be uh, rounded up. To be rounded up. Yeah. So even though you had been given French citizenship, it was taken away from you. Exactly. Yeah. And many years after the war, I found out uh, that actually I was French. And, mm. and I became French again. And became French <laughs> again. Okay. After war broke out, you, you and your family left Paris for a second time, but returned for a short period. In May 1940, Germany invaded Holland, Luxembourg, and Belgium, and then quickly followed by invading France in June of 1940. You then fled Paris for a third time and returned to Paris again. Tell us what you know about why your parents left, why your parents left Paris each time and why they returned, and then once you were back for that third time, what was life like for you? Because now you're under the Germans. Yes, well, uh, my father said I have to earn a living. And mm. when they fled and to a little town called Sel sur Belle, okay. uh, uh, we left for three weeks. It was a wonderful family that gave us their dining room and their kitchen. And, uh, but then my father said, uh, I have to go back home. Because his business was yes, there. Right. Okay, okay. So you'd return to Paris. Yeah. Um, um, you mentioned earlier that, that period when there was no war, even though the war had begun in, with the invasion of Poland, um, you had referred to it as the phony war. Mm -hmm. And that was that period between the war beginning, but it wasn't in France yet. Yeah, so. la drôle de guerre, it was called in French. So in English, phony, but it was really funny. You know, what kind of a war is that? And the soldiers were back at home and uh, uh, there was nothing happening and mm -hmm. uh, they were hoping, of course, that nothing would happen, but it did. And all that changed, of course. Yeah. At one point, you shared with me that your, your parents considered leaving for a Dutch colony, but they didn't. Uh, what, what, tell us about Cura that. Curaçao was a Dutch colony. Curaçao. Curaçao. And um, my father, I believe, asked the Queen of Holland, uh, it was Queen Wilhelmina at that time, if she would uh, help uh, the Jews, and uh, nothing happened. And I did a lot of research in mm -hmm. that, and I found out that uh, even if Curacy would have accepted uh, uh, Dutch Jews, uh, there is uh, almost a total certainty that we would not have been accepted in Curacao. Even though you might have gotten the permission, they wouldn't have accepted you possibly, so you didn't go. No, so we didn't go, we stayed in France. Yeah. You and your sister Manuela, you both have some early memories, I think, of the German attack on France and Paris. What, what do you remember about that? I remember seeing German soldiers mm -hmm. uh, getting into uh, Paris. We lived in uh, 
uh, suburb called Samande and next to the zoo that I loved. Of course, mm -hmm. it became forbidden for us to go to the zoo and other places. But I, I, I remember the, their uniforms and their faces and uh, it was not very pleasant. Right. One of the um, things you also shared and you write about is on, after, the, after the Germans invaded and, and began marching on Paris on June 10th, 1940, your family joined hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other uh, 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 French people as well, and particularly Parisians fleeing en masse out of Paris. What do you remember of that? That was the third time. My father was able to uh, borrow a little um, van from his office. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember taking my doll and my sister, had her doll, uh, people always ask me, what was her name? She never had a name, but I have the doll. <laughs> you still have the doll yes, to this day. I do. And that was what you took with you yes. in this exodus out of, Fra out of yeah, Paris. Right, and I know from some other survivors that uh, it was extremely dangerous because uh, there were bombardments and uh, uh, that's how he lost, uh, that's uh, Albert Garrig that you know, he lost his grandmother mm -hmm. and members of his uh, family. We had no family with us in France, but right. it was the four of us. And so we spent those three weeks in that wonderful family. They were so, and we, we saw them after the war, they died now. But uh, the family Riviere, they were wonderful people. And they took you in for several weeks. Yes. Yeah. And then of course you again returned to Paris. Yes. Um, one of the things you shared with me is that your, your father um, witnessed um, Germans uh, beating black soldiers. Yes, on the way back from that uh, little town, mm -hmm. uh, he saw uh, German soldiers beating uh, an African contingent. You know, Fran France had colonies, okay. and it was uh, one of the colonies. And, and my father said in his, uh, in his memoir when he was interviewed after the war, now we know what's going to happen to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Once so he saw that, he knew what was in store. Yes, right. So now you're, you're, you're back in, in Paris. Yeah. Paris is an occupied city. Do you know if many other Jews returned to Paris like you did? Uh, some of them did and mm -hmm. some of them did not. Right. I have a very good friend uh, uh, whose parents fled to Toulouse in the south of France and never got back. And, and never came back. Later on, they were rounded up. Okay. And, and speaking of the roundups, of course, you, you and your family continued to live in Paris until the summer of 1942, so really for the next two years. And at that time, in the summer of 1942, your parents arranged for the four of you to leave Paris for Vichy, or Free France, as it was called. Tell, tell us the events that led up to your parents making the decision to once again leave Paris, but this time to head for the, uh, the unoccupied zone of, of France. And, and how you ended up, or how they found this little village where you would then spend well, almost three years. It's a very long story. And uh, my parents' friends, they had some very good friends, uh, kept on telling them, you can't stay in Paris, it's too dangerous. By that time, we were wearing the Jewish star. I remember the Jewish star. And I remember on a Sunday morning. You have morning, a picture of it here, yes, don't you? Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. And I was wearing that, and you my sister that. was wearing that. And uh, it was on a Sunday morning, and I was wearing, it was in June of 42, uh, May or June. And uh, um, when I interviewed in that project to remember me, I talked to. Uh, somebody who had survived like me. And she said, uh, oh yes, I remember that Sunday morning and uh, I was wearing a red dress and I had that yellow star. But me, I was wearing a green sweater and I remember that vividly, that uh, uh, I said I was so pretty, the, the yellow star on my green sweater. You I had no concept of, of what that uh, really no, meant. No. I think you also shared with me that um, you were required by the Nazis that was, it was to be sewn tightly on your clothing, but your mom didn't do that. Yes, she did. She, oh, she did tie. I, she did sew yes, it very it tightly. It was compulsory. You couldn't just pin it. 
you had to sew it on mm -hmm. and uh, my sister recalls something uh, very uh, vividly, very clearly is that the school teacher, I was in kindergarten, right. she was, uh, well, she's uh, 20 months older than me and she said uh, the teacher, I think Madame Begin, uh, oh, anyway, she called uh, Manuela uh, to the podium, you know, French class from the podium and said, you have to be very nice to this little girl because she's living in very hard times. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very dangerous on the part of the teacher. The teacher to do that. Because the kids could go home and say, oh, we have a Jewish kid in the classroom. And it could have been the end of my sister right, right. and uh, the end of the teacher. The end of the and teacher, the teacher too. survived, as I understand, yeah. I, don't, I know the next day, the Monday, uh, my father took us to school. Uh, I don't remember being scared. Uh, I remember other things about that kindergarten, like we had to eat uh, at recess, we had to uh, uh, or drink uh, powdered milk and it tasted so bad, but we had to do that. It was food, you know, right. and we didn't have much food to eat. Uh, even then, and then something I, I haven't told you yet, but I, in past years I have, is that uh, my father lost his job, and uh, there was a, he, he went illegally, probably on his bicycle, and helped his associate. Uh, but he had a, an acquaintance in Marseille that was uh, selling uh, spaghetti, and. Um, we sat in the kitchen, I remember that, and we ate spaghetti and spaghetti. So don't ask me if I like spaghetti. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> before you left, um, I think it was in late 1941, before you left Paris for that last time, your mother received um, a farewell letter from her mother, your grandmother, Omi. Tell us about that letter that she got. She, my grandmother in Hamburg never used the word suicide. She said farewell. Uh, I have a copy of that letter and she says goodbye to all of us. <laughs> and it was uh, very sad, but I, I don't really remember clearly. All I know is that on her birthday, Every year, my mother put an azalea on the, her piano uh, as a memory to her mother. And she had uh, gone to a concert that evening in Paris, and she had this uh, premonition that perhaps something terrible was happening. But uh, the German polizei, the criminal polizei, they went, uh, it was, I believe, the 21st of November, 1941. They found her uh, dead on the floor and uh, in her nightgown. And uh, they found four tubes of veronal, which is, uh, I don't know how my grandmother got the poison, except she had uh, German friends that were doctors. Mm -hmm. and, and she also turned on the gas in the kitchen and there was an explosion. And um, so, and she was buried. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the war, my mother went to the Jewish cemetery, Oldsdorf, in Hamburg, and found uh, her tomb. She went with uh, my grandmother, with her brother, Irving, who had escaped. Uh, he was in Sachsenhausen and escaped and went to Brazil and to New York and they went together to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. No, no, I, 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 that's what I, I wanted you to tell us that. Um, another um, sort of interesting little thing you shared with me about your father is that he went out and purchased a cheap radio and that... Yes. It, and why did he go purchase specifically a cheap because radio? Because it was forbidden for Jews to have a radio. They say, the, the uh, French authorities actually, the French authorities said, oh, those Jews are going to tell bad news about the Germans. So he had to report and give his good radio, uh, which I, I forget, well, I don't know what it was, to the authorities, and instead he bought a cheap radio. To, so give, could, to, the, yeah. to give to the Nazis yes. and continue yes. to listen to his good radio. Yeah. Also, my father 
kept on saying, we are going to do what they want and they'll leave us alone. And these are his words. Mm -hmm. And so we registered, we were registered as Jews at the little town hall there in our suburb of uh, Saint-Mandé. Yeah. Jacqueline, your parents made the decision and planned their departure from Paris for the final time following a really massive roundup of Jews yes. in Paris in July of 1942. Uh, July 16 and 17, they were rounding up Jews uh, massively and the French police was rounding them up and they forgot to ring our bell. We were registered. You, you were supposed to go too. Well, yes. Yeah. And uh, they um, came one week after we had fled. So, so the, the first time they just, just forgot to come to your door, essentially? Probably. Yeah. And that's when you, you got, out, got out of Paris. You described your parents as arranging your departure very quietly. Say a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, those wonderful friends, uh, the family Paris, said, well, you can't uh, leave like that with your Jewish star and uh, take the metro because the Jews could only uh, take the last uh, train. Uh, why don't you come and spend the last night with us? And uh, which we did. We, we my, my um, parents, very good friends, they were 15 years old, purchased backpacks mm -hmm. and they took the backpacks to the train station called La Gare d'Austerlitz, Paris at several stations and um, and they bought the train tickets because it was forbidden you needed a visa you needed an Ausweis as they call them in German and all that was forbidden for us you know everything was forbidden going to the zoo was forbidden going to the park my father's business was gone everything life was forbidden to us and uh, so we went to that wonderful family Geneviève and Maurice Paris and uh, I have a, a, a memento here that I always wear when I speak. And it's this, you know, most people in France are Catholic. Right. Uh, very few Jews and Protestants. And uh, Geneviève gave me this, which is Notre Dame de Lourdes. If anybody is Catholic here, then they know Notre Dame de Lourdes and uh, what was the name, the Soubirou that saved, and she said, and my, my sister has a medal. My mother, I don't know what happened to it, but imagine all those years, I have that medal today. That's the one that was yes. given to you when you That's left the Paris. One. That not, and then her husband, Maurice, went down in the, in the basement, and even though it was late July, he turned on the stove and he took our Jewish stars and burned them. Mm. But my parents didn't have false ID cards, and it said Juif, Jew. Right on their ID yes. cards, yeah. So they could have caught us, but we made it to the train, uh, Gardo Sterlitz, and we retrieved, uh, I don't know if the boys, the two boys, they were 15 years old, they were working in the resistance. If they got uh, the uh, backpacks from my parents, uh, what did we have? A sweater with us, and, uh, and my father had our ID cards where it said Jew, but it's On his ID yeah, card. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the train wouldn't leave. We got on the train with uh, whatever papers we had, I think it said Drift, uh, and the train wouldn't leave. And I remember that. And the train would leave, and the train wouldn't leave. And my father became frantic and went to the head of that particular uh, wagon. Uh, that car? Car. Yeah. And uh, see so what's going on. And the woman said, oh, they are rounding up Jews on the other side of the tracks. So that was a miracle, that uh, one of the many, many, many miracles oh. that they had their, their quota of Jews, or as they call them in German, Stück, the Jews, and they didn't go to our train. And the train started to go slowly, slowly, and we left. And uh, we, the train had to stop. Well, my parents had arranged, or my father rather, from the Dutch club, had arranged the two um, uh, smugglers, if you want, as they call them these days. In French, it's called un passeur. Passeur, yeah. yeah. 
and um, we were supposed to meet them, but we had to change trains in a little town called Angoulême. I don't know if, you, if it's on the map there. Uh, and uh, we had to change train and go on to, onto a little little train, and my sister fell down, and uh, I think she still remembers the, the 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 bump on the head. And imagine if it had been a, a serious a, injury, thing, yeah. we would have had to go to a hospital. That would have been the end of yep. us. But she said it's okay. We went on that little train. And uh, we got to that uh, station where the smugglers were supposed to meet us. And he, they said, we can't take and you. And these are the smugglers to take you across yes. the uh, yes. demarcation line. And they said, we can't take we you. Can't. Why? Did they have other Jews? Did they have, uh, was it too dangerous at night? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we couldn't go. We went to a hotel and they said, we'll meet in two days or in one day, I'm not sure. And uh, we'll meet in the cemetery next to the church in that uh, little town. What was it called? Monterral, I think. Uh, anyway, we did. And it was midnight and uh, it was, uh, well, it was the summer. But it was, it's still cool at night, you know, uh, in, in July. It was July 31st, I think. Um, and uh, they were there. So one of them was um, the son of a baker. The other one was the uh, son of a farmer. They were very young. I mm -hmm. uh, never found them again. Never but they were again. very brave. And uh, they came with their bicycles. And uh, we started walking. And it, it's, you know, at night it, through the woods, it's, it's wet. And uh, Manuela suddenly said, I have to do pee pee. Sounds funny, but it could have been tragic. Right. Fortunately, the, you know, the Germans were there, and we were there. And it was very, very close. And they, um, they didn't hear us. And then the, the smugglers put Manuela and me on uh, their bicycle and the other smuggler went ahead and he had a whistling uh, signal with my father to announce uh, it's okay uh, if it were okay mm -hmm. um, and we crossed the border uh, and uh, my father wrote in when he was interviewed after the war that uh, he, he um, he saw or he heard a motorcycle, they were probably German, you know, the Germans were there, and then there was a French contingent of uh, soldiers permitted but between Pétain and Hitler uh, for a while, not for very long. Not for long, right. And, and so we made it, and uh, we got to the, uh, uh, to the end of that uh, crossing in the middle of the night, and uh, I remember hearing one of those soldiers saying, qui va là? I mean, who goes there? And it's a military term, a French military term. And uh, he um, took us to the uh, barracks and we spent the night. In the there. barracks? Yes. Mm -hmm. But then the next morning, the uh, commandant, the man in charge, said, you know, we can't keep you. And they took us under escort. That was Monterral, actually. And uh, we didn't know anybody. And uh, my parents checked in a hotel and we were very tired, and uh, the bell, the, there was a knock at the door, my parents were under arrest. And uh, they were interrogated. I have the, all those papers. And this was by, by the, the French authorities. Yes, yep. yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in a hotel, when you uh, went to a hotel, you had to register. So whether it was the uh, head of the hotel or the, whoever, the guardian who denounced us, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we were in Montreal, and then they took us again there was all those papers that my father signed. My mother was interrogated for 15 minutes. My father was interrogated for 15 minutes. They both said that they had uh, something, uh, I don't know exactly how many francs. And uh, my father said that he had the uh, money and some jewelry uh, with France in Lyon. And I have a feeling that his associate, because he had given up his business, his associate probably uh, kept money for, for us, for later, wherever we would be. So anyway, they took us under escort and uh, to um, Perigueux, which is the headquarters 
uh, of that uh, department, like a state, you know, in the US you have a state and you have a governor, and that was very good. And my parents had to uh, go to uh, the headquarters every day, every day, and I uh, have a copy of those papers as well. Uh, and uh, there was a uh, prefect, the man ahead of the governor, like a super governor, who had the orders from Pétain to... Um, who was the head of Vichy France. Yes. Right. To uh, let us go if we could prove that we had enough money uh, that we wouldn't be... Um, yeah. Dependent, uh, on depending on the uh, yeah, I'm looking my, for my words. Mm -hmm. uh, dependent on uh, the authorities. Right. Uh, France, that part of France was not occupied, but still, uh, my father could prove that he had uh, some money. Mm -hmm. That uh, and so the that uh, prefet or the man above uh, said, "Okay, get lost." And uh, we uh, were allowed to go 100 kilometers, 60 miles, not more, from uh, Perigueux. And we were registered in uh, Salah, the head of uh, Jewish affairs. We were registered all the way to Pétain. They could come any day. They did come, actually. Uh, but for uh, the man who lived downstairs from us, uh, I can tell you that yeah. in a few minutes. So, so you were allowed to leave, but you had to stay within yes. 60 miles of the... Of the right. And, my, and the train, that little counter train was still working. And uh, my father or my parents found uh, that little village called Le Gat, Le Gat. and oh, Mazerol, and uh, we were the only Jews except for one uh, other family. And uh, the mayor was, uh, he's the one that uh, I was able to declare, well, he's dead now a long time ago, but I, was, I had him declare as uh, righteous among the nations. And, and I'm going to want you to tell us more about that a little bit later. So yeah. you're now in this little village. Tell us what life was like for you. You're, you're the only Jew in the village, Jews in the village. What was, what was it like for you in this little place, hi hidden essentially? Yeah, well, uh, we lived on chestnuts mostly. Lived on chestnuts. <laughs> My mother made the bread and cake and everything with chestnuts. And, and I think we had walnuts. And then in the summer, we went and got some uh, strawberries. And uh, there was not much at all. Once in a while, we got eggs. And uh, which was a blessing. And then the farmer, there was a farmer there, Monsieur Vigier, who was uh, uh, who couldn't write. He was an alphabet. And uh, he, my father, wrote uh, in his name a letter saying that uh, he was um, going to be helping. Uh, he was a farmhand, and my father didn't know about how to grow potatoes, but he. But instead of a farmhand, and it's in my book, he was in hiding most of the time. Most of the time. In a little place uh, from the Middle Ages. Uh, and he couldn't lie down, he couldn't sit up. You know. It was pretty horrible. Jacqueline, about a year after you got to Lagat, because you were there for 29 months, I believe. Yes. In August 1943, your mother gave birth to your brother Franklin. Tell us about his birth and what it meant to you, your parents, you and your sister, now having an infant living with you while you are in hiding in this little village. Tell us about that. Well, my, my mother became pregnant uh, and uh, in the, not too long after we fled and hid, and uh, in May of 43, when things were, all of France was occupied, you know, since November 11, 1942, all of France was occupied, the Germans were so all there was over. no longer a, 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 an unoccupied part of France. No, there was no such thing, yeah. so the Germans were all over. But uh, so my mother, uh, well, if we had more time, I could tell you that the Americans landed in Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia, and, uh, and Hitler right. was furious. And that's why he decided November 11, 1942, all of France is occupied. Mm -hmm. So my mother became pregnant. She was very sick. And, you know, there was no doctor. There was nothing for right. her. 
And uh, I have little notes, little letters that I wrote uh, in French, of course. I, my French was getting a little better, maybe, and saying, I hope you will feel better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Your and mother almost died giving birth, didn't she? What? She almost died yes, giving she did. birth. Yeah. She did. Um, so in May of 43, my parents took us on the... Uh, I'm sorry, I become too emotional. No. Um, took us on their lap. I think I was on my father's lap and you know, on my mother's lap and saying, you know, we have no money and you will not get a gift for a birthday, but uh, there will be a surprise. And my sister guessed that it was going to be a baby. A baby. Yeah. And, and my brother, well, under terrible circumstances, was transported, which was forbidden. It was the middle of the night, and she, she was not allowed to travel. We had temporary uh, papers uh, right. from that wonderful uh, mayor, but it's a drift. So the if there had been the police, French police, right. uh, that day, uh, that night, because it was the night, and I think it was a Friday, uh, she would have been caught. But she made it to uh, the next uh, area called lot garonne and there was a wonderful person there who uh, uh, was in the resistance and a doctor. And uh, on one side they had an Englishman that had uh, crossed uh, Belgium and France and that way I wounded. And on the other side there was a Jewish woman. And uh, my mother had a terrible birth, but my brother was born. And your parents named your brother Franklin, which is not exactly a French name. Um, so tell us why. Well, when we were still in Paris, my father had his radio and uh, he read news about Roosevelt. And for him, it was, Roosevelt is going to save us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I have a young audience, I always say, why Franklin? It was Franklin Roosevelt. Now we know better about Roosevelt, but my parents were hoping that uh, Franklin Roosevelt would, would save, save us. Yeah. You remained in Legat for, for, for 29 months, more than two years. Um, how do you think during that time that your, your parents were able to avoid being denounced and therefore arrested and, and taken away? Well, how, do, how do you think that was able well, to, to work the, for you? The, the farmers were very poor, mm -hmm. but very honest, and what we call in French uh, républicain, I mean, they uh, believed in an uh, honest country. Uh, there were many prisoners of war. Uh, I had that little friend uh, who is my age now, General Matagut, his father was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. And uh, they Oh, they were prisoners hated. of war, the Germans. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They hated uh, the Germans. Okay. And uh, they knew we were refugees in that tiny, tiny village, but I don't think they knew what Jews were. Mm. We were refugees, period. You were refugees, yes. okay. And, uh, but that was not your question, was it? Oh, how... how um, well, you, no, you were answering it. I was asking why you think you weren't denounced. Yeah. Yeah. And because uh, they, they were honest people and they hated the Germans and... and yeah, they and they were them. very poor. And very poor. And then the, the resistance came and the Germans at that time and stole whatever goods those peasants had. You know, we had no meat, we had no nothing, and they stole those goods. Sometimes it was the resistance, the underground people, they needed to eat too. And uh, I should tell you something. Uh, that uh, we went to that little school uh, thanks to the mayor uh, and uh, uh, in the beginning um, and uh, the, the priest, uh, Catholic priest of course, uh, said the mass and I remember seeing them doing the uh, the sign of the cross, but first of all, I'm left-handed, so I could never do it. And besides, we were imitating the other children for their catechism, and uh, so it was uh, very odd. But it, on Sunday, he did the mass, and uh, all the uh, resistants, the underground people, were uh, in the back of the church, 
and uh, hoping for a good word on the part of the priest. For the resistance he, fighters. Yes, yes, he was a wonderful priest, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and speaking of some wonderful people, you've mentioned the mayor, Mr. Del Pesh. Tell us what he did for you. He, he, he warned us every time there was, at one time, uh, he told Manuela and me that we should go to a convent uh, in another town and we would have had to walk, of course, in no other to way. To walk there, to go a, hide. I remember we prepared a little bag with, and then he said, don't, because there are German trucks and you'll be caught, so we never went. That's one thing. And then he told, my father had long conversations with him at night uh, when he, he could uh, get away from his hiding place and uh, they confided in each other. And uh, uh, he helped us, uh, we had to go and hide uh, uh, in a, outside of our hiding place because it was too dangerous and we, we, we were hiding in a, where they put the poultry, the, uh, what do you call that? Put the poultry? Uh, what? In the, you, you mean a chicken coop? Oh, chicken coop chicken in coop, English, yeah. maybe, yeah. And uh, so we spent the night there. Also, um, there was no crib, no nothing for my baby brother, but there was that wonderful uh, woman who had, uh, I don't know how many children, and she gave uh, my mother, or lent my mother, a little um, carriage. Uh, don't ask me how primitive it was, but it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how my mother found uh, about uh, uh, clothing for my baby brother. And she had, a, she, there was a merchant or something and she was able to get diapers, but uh, you had to go and wash them uh, in a cold place there in the middle of the village. And my poor mother with her hands, you know, she had to do that. And uh, the, the, the farmer's wife there, Madame Lamoureau, said, but you don't have to wash them, just hang them up and use them again. It sounds funny, but it was right. tragic for my parents, right. you know. And, and generally, um, not only were you not denounced, but you said generally most everybody in the village was very kind to you. Yeah. And, this, and the mayor, of course, did all kinds of things to Oh, yes, yeah. To, but to I had one, one insult. Right. And I think it's in my memoirs that uh, one girl, we were on that little trail there in front of the house and uh, maybe singing, I don't know. We didn't sing really during the war. But um, uh, that, that girl, and I don't know, I don't know what her name said, Oh, aren't you ashamed to play with uh, uh, Jews that are dirty like pigs in the stable or something like that? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was such an issue, so I went home, of course, and uh, that was not something nice to say. And, but and otherwise, of course, no. And that could have led to some real danger oh, yes. if she'd said something. Of course. Right? Yeah, her, she must have heard the word Jew at home. Yeah. Mm. Jacqueline, after the Normandy invasion in June of 1944, Paris was soon liberated in August. After the liberation of Paris, your father made his way back to Paris um, and then came back I, later in 1944, I think in November, to get his family and take you all back to Paris. Tell us about that time. Tell us, first of all, tell us about your father learning about D-Day, learning about the, yes, the invasion. In French, it's called le débarquement. Le débarquement, that's D-Day. And uh, my father, it was in June, of course, as we know, uh, June 6, 1944, and my father heard about it. And he was in a tree, he was picking, it was uh, time for cherries, and he wanted to bring us some food. And he heard that, and he fell from the tree, <laughs> but he didn't break anything. But but That's, so excited about the yes, news, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we, we knew in my journal, in uh, what we call our baby book, which is in the archives here, uh, that uh, it was a big event, and we were all hoping for that. And we wrote, and Manuela wrote in hers, and I wrote in mine that uh, we will see all our family again, which, of course, never happened. Um, 
And, uh, but you know, it was far from the end of the war. Right. And in, in, in 44, there's a village uh, that my parents knew about called Oradour sur Glane, and uh, the Bremer division came all the way, and uh, that village was denounced. And it was the women and men were put in the church. The church was burned. The men were on the wall and uh, were all shot. It was a crime to such extent that to this day, that village is a memorial. It has never been rebuilt. Never been rebuilt. It's no. just what was yes. left. Jacqueline, and you're right, the war would continue until May 1945, but your father went right away to Paris. Not right away. <laughs> but what did he find? When he could, when, when he, he could. could, you know, yeah. there were no trains. Right. And uh, I don't know how he made it to Paris. Did he do it by bicycle? Or maybe there was a train? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But he, he wanted to go back to look to see if he had a business and if we had an apartment. Our apartment was occupied the whole time uh, by German soldiers or German officers, I don't know. But that was after the liberation of Paris. After the liberation of after Paris, right. After August 44, yeah. you know. And uh, he found out that the apartment was there, but they, where was the furniture? It had been all put uh, here and there and in the little town hall. And he tried to manage, oh, this is our dresser, or this is our table, or this is this. And he found some pieces of furniture. Uh, but his business was in shambles. There was nothing. When later on, when we came back to Paris, he was selling jam from door to door. Mm -hmm. to try selling jam from door to door. To mm -hmm. try and make a living, right. yeah. When, when you all returned to Paris in November 1944, again, the war would continue after that for almost seven months. Um, what was life like for your parents? Your, your father selling jam. Was he trying to rebuild his business? Were you able to go back to school yet, or? Yeah, my sister and I got a wonderful four-year scholarship uh, to a school, which has changed name now, I found out not so long ago, Le Cour Racine. And the uh, head of that school was a hero herself in the Résistance. And uh, she gave us those four years, private school, no fee to pay. And we had to catch up, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was a, a grand thing on her part. She was a very good woman. And uh, the concierge was there. And then my mother had, had, a, had acquired a, a piano. Uh, I made a drawing. It's in, uh, it's, I think it's in my book. Um, and uh, the book, the piano was given to a neighbor uh, I don't know how they transported that at, in the middle of the night. Right. And uh, that uh, man kept the piano the whole war. And they had a little boy, Jackie, but he was not allowed to touch the piano because what would have been said all those months, all those years, you know, with a piano suddenly. And that was my mother. And then the, the woman on the fourth floor, Madame Deneu, uh, kept uh, important things uh, and then uh, she sent she was able to make a package and send it to my father's uh, fake name Monsieur Frédéric and uh, so we were able to get some clothes and some um, effects uh, and uh, I don't know that's how we survived so these neighbors and friends had hung on to the things for the family yeah um, yeah and, and bicycles too although that yeah. didn't last very long and 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 uh, we got our dolls yeah. got your dolls Jacqueline when when did your parents learn what happened to the other members of your extended extended family elsewhere well the war in Holland lasted uh, much longer. Mm -hmm. There was that terrible winter. And then uh, my father found out from his cousin, his first cousin, Dora Mendels, that uh, uh, most people were, had been uh, murdered. Um, uh, my father went to the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. That's how he found out that his mother had been murdered in Sobibor, which is even east of Auschwitz. And uh, in that, that was in 
43, he was incredibly, uh, my father was so sure, and he wrote in uh, my brother's journal, uh, Omar will be so happy to have a boy in the family. And he had no idea that his mother had uh, perished in a, if you go to the permanent exhibit, you see those uh, trains where they put uh, people and uh, from Westerbork, north of Amsterdam, to uh, uh, Sobibor. Yeah. And uh, then he found out uh, that uh, everybody else, uh, little by little, uh, through the Red Cross, I believe, that everybody else would. And we know now that we have uh, 200 members of our family that have been murdered. 200 members of your family. And my, my brother, daughter, Jessica, did a lot of research. My daughter did a lot of research as well. And uh, so that's what the count, and they are still looking, I think. Jacqueline, we're close to the time to end the program, and there's so much more I would like you to tell us, but your memoir, which you're, you're gonna sign copies of afterwards, tell us what it meant to you to write this, but also tell us about your title. Well, yes, my, my niece, who was so instrumental in taking photos and things that uh, that neighbor had kept for us, okay. and she asked me, how do you want to call? And right away, I said, if you know French, then you will know that every Sunday morning, my parents said, let's be alive one more week, and let's be alive next Sunday. And so I kept that in and my head. And that's what that means? Yes. One more week. Yeah. Mm. Well, it means until next Sunday. Until meaning, next Sunday. Let's be alive next Sunday. Yeah. And they would, they would say that to each yes. other. Yes. And to us, the four of us. To the four of you. Yeah. Mm. Right. It's a marvelous, marvelous memoir, I have to say. A very sad, uh, but very powerful as well. Um, Jacqueline, it's time for us to close our program. Um, we're gonna hear from Jacqueline again in just a moment, so I'm gonna ask you to stay with us. Um, we obviously, there was so much more Jacqueline could have shared with us, we, we had to skip over a great deal. We didn't have a chance for you to ask questions, so remember that you can do that with us online as well. Um, and also when Jacqueline goes up to sign copies of her, her memoir, that also might be a chance for you if you have a question to ask her. Uh, please do so. Um, it's our tradition that our first person has the last word. Uh, and so I'm going to turn to Jacqueline for that in just a moment. Remind you that we have a program each Wednesday and Thursday till the middle of August. We'd love you to come back, but if you can't, all of our programs are now available on the YouTube uh, page of the museum so you can view our other programs, and we hope you do. When Jacqueline is finished, right before she leaves the stage to go up there so she can sign copies of her memoir. Our photographer, Lolita, is gonna come up on the stage, take a photograph of Jacqueline with you as the background. So we want you to stay with us for that. So I'll now turn to Jacqueline for Jacqueline's uh, last word for us today. Well, I thank you, all of you, for listening so patiently to this horrible story. But I always say, maybe it's not so horrible because I'm alive, and so is my sister. Uh, but I find that you listen to the news or you don't listen to the news every day or every night, and you see that there are horrible things happening all the time. And uh, when I speak to you, the young generation especially, I say, you have to try and do good. And, uh, hope that this earth will improve, this globe, because right now it's in very bad shape and I'm not very optimistic for my uh, nephews and nieces and my daughter and my granddaughter. Uh, it's just uh, frightening to read and listen to all the bad events that we hear every day and every day and in every country in the world. So we have to try and improve things if we can. <laughs>